From you, the prisoner in the velvet mask, amiability is all we ask. All we require is that your every move should imitate the tin hairs in its groove. Behind opaque and lockable front doors, we feather our own nests and snipe at yours. No need to stipulate that you stand still for mockery. We know full well you will. But, hero, icon, patsy, plaster saint, our perfect gentle knight without a taint, what luck you are, what you're supposed to be. We've got you where we want you, haven't we? Charles Charming's challenges on the pathway to the throne. Book One. Of life and love and liberty I sing, and of the Prince of Wales, our future king. But Wales is not his last name, first things first. At birth, the boy was blessed, some might say cursed, with the august surname Charming, family handle of princes from Cocaine to Coromandel, who all descend directly from a Greek ship-owning house of which I will not speak, except to say that if you trace it back to when the Persians sailed to the attack at Salamis, you'll find the vivid sea signed with the honour of that dynasty, who groomed their sons for marriage, not for slaughter, and always steered toward the eldest daughter. Suffice to note it was a charming boy who wed Elizabeth and brought her joy, a fiery Greek with clean-cut Danish fair good looks, perhaps a wee bit short of hair. His name was Philip. Proudly he now stood beside the crib and found the contents good, a bright new flowering on a family tree that went back to at least the Odyssey. The king and queen had come to take a look and leave a gift. It was a ration book, for this was still the era of austerity, when every luxury was still a rarity. No wonder, then, news of the royal birth threw instantly a girdle round the earth. The fountains in Trafalgar Square ran blue, the gutters in Calcutta did so too, or sort of blue. The empire, might and main, strove to forget that it was on the wane. The future queen had had a son. A cheer went up that you can practically still hear. Their tot, the doting parents were agreed, must be called Charles, plus all the names he'd need to satisfy heraldic protocol. In other words, enough to fill a scroll. I'd like to list them, but there'd not be room if I raved on until the crack of doom, like Moses' monologues in Deuteronomy. And anyway, my watchword is economy. Likewise, a man of few words, Philip spoke. Thank Christ it's over. Sturdy little bloke. Bit short of chin, perhaps. Still, you can't tell. Right sort of food. Might turn out bloody well. Propped up among the pillows, weak with joy, his wife declared, We are so glad it's a boy. The monarchy's a man's job in our view. Though, when our turn comes, we dare say we'll do. And on she twittered in the royal plural. In those days, no one got an epidural, and though she'd taken pleasure in her pain, she'd found the whole thing something of a strain. At this point, Cecil Beeline, not yet knighted, came shuffling on. He looked a bit short-sighted. Oh, Lilibet, he cried. I've never seen a princess looking so much like a queen. The queens I've known have generally been men. But you'll soon be a real queen. What fun then. And on your feet already. My, what strength. And there's your husband lying down full length. That negligee. He looks so sweet, my dear. And this must be the baby over here. Delightful skin, like Garbo, my old flame. Now, watch the birdie. Say cheese. What's your name? He photographed a corgi with great care. Elizabeth looked on with fond despair and knighted him. He blinked away his tears and raced off to start spending thirty years as that delightful stuttering old nutter, Sir Cecil Beeline, first knight of the shutter. By now towards the palace had come swarming the whole world, but the gates withstood the storming. They swung aside, their bare-skinned guards saluting, only when challenged by the silver fluting of Daimler grills. Hoarse cries of, Here they, they come, come. Go bless, bless em. Em. Paved the way for the king's mum, Queen Mary, likewise Princess Margaret Rose. 
and Crawfy, too, had followed her keen nose, infallibly attracted to the spot where, with discretion, she could spill the lot. Queen Mary, in her usual gracious style, bestowed on everyone her tiny smile. She smiled at faithful servants, one and all. She smiled at suits of armour in the hall. She smiled at her dear Lilibet. Some chap came to attention and took off his cap. Oh, yes, the husband. Philip, that was it. Names tend to slip when you get on a bit. But look at this. Yes, every inch a king. With any luck she'd see the christening, provided it was not delayed too long. From front on, the child's chin looked almost strong. Margaret, meanwhile, stood at the window. Two hot tears slid down her cheeks, for there he flew, so close that she could touch him, yet so far. The man the rules had placed out of her star, Group Captain Peter Wetten, DFC. He zoomed around defying gravity, with victory rolls and other aerobatic manoeuvres he thought suitably ecstatic. But underneath the wings over his breast, his noble heart was cracking in his chest. His hurricane fell like a falling leaf, and spiralled upward like a sob of grief. With canopy pulled back it made a pass, at stalling speed so low the backyard grass turned dark with prop wash. So he waved farewell, while Philip bellowed, Blast and bloody hell, that noisy blight has curdled my wife's milk. But at that moment wet end hit the silk. His plane had clipped a statue of John Brown with its port wingtip and turned upside down. The sad group captain somersaulted clear and drifted off along the atmosphere, and with one last, lost gesture he was gone, puffed by the breeze into oblivion. But Margaret's lonely vigil was made brief by being caught up in a general grief. She and the other royal women soon perforce wore morning, morning, night and noon. The king was dead. Long live the queen. The rain fell softly into London like the grain of some old photograph in black and white. The glass streets were long mirrors full of light, as down them the gun carriage slowly rolled, drawn by young ratings capless in the cold. The pipers played my home, the foot guards marched with arms reversed and every throat was parched, despite the fact that every cheek was wet. But why evoke what no one can forget, unless, of course... Please say it isn't true. You weren't alive in 1952. But everyone was, weren't they? Anyhow, Prince Charles was, and that fact will do for now. For now, down the same streets, but in warm weather, a different procession altogether hove into view, with e'en the humblest violet clad in a panoply of gold and scarlet, while what the knobs wore might have made a bird of paradise feel just a bit absurd. The drumsticks danced in pairs. The Queen of Tonga led all the younger crowned heads in a conga, while those too old to show a pair of heels shook to the rhythm of the carriage wheels. The golden coach went by. The queen inside it was radiant and did not try to hide it, for following the coach came ample proof of her intention not to be aloof. It was the golden pram. Pushing with pride, the faithful Crawfy modified her stride to match the progress of the coach in front and so avoid the least hint of a shunt. The prince, meanwhile, employed his small right hand in ways the world had learned to understand might be regarded as the royal wave. The sight sufficed to make the groundlings rave, despite the fact his arm moved half an inch, as if controlled by pulley, wire and winch. The queen's own gesture, echoed by her child, did weird things to a crowd already wild. They hugged each other, sinking to their knees. Whole families toppled backwards out of trees, while Richard Dimbledon announced the dawn of a new era. Something has been born today. A new Elizabethan age. New figures have begun to take the stage. New hopes, new aspirations. Everest has just been conquered by the very best type of young man. Sir Edmund did not flinch as day by day and painful inch by inch the Sherpas piggybacked him to the peak. And now I'm with young Charles. Perhaps he'll speak about this great new mood of victory. We're all 
so moved by at the B, B, C. But Charles, who at that time was barely four, could only say... One's not exactly sure one can fulfil one's role. One lives in hope that in the long run one will learn to cope. And thus his life of sacrifice began long, long before he grew to be a man. The Empire shrank, but few cared. If Charles grew, that was enough to justify the new Elizabethan age, which proved indeed to be a fine time for the British breed, but not because their power increased, far from it. The flag came down as often as the comet on country after country. What was good was how the people broadly understood that the time had come to give back with good grace the Empire's lion's share of living space, and learn to live within their limitations as just one in a commonwealth of nations. The Fleet Street lords absorbed the lesson last, but with the sewers boob they caught on fast and prated less of military might, shifting the emphasis to moral right, which concept it's a British native oddity to treat as an exportable commodity. Thus Britain's role aspired to the symbolic, which made the Queen's task almost apostolic, she rose to the occasion, as we know, though it might easily have not been so. Unfettered by parameters statistical, her worldwide influence was well-nigh mystical, and just because one woman was called royal, whole countries were delighted to stay loyal. The point, she saw with prescient acuity, was to maintain the cherished continuity while always being ready to adapt. Thus centuries of precedent were scrapped and Charles was sent to school, just as if he were made of common clay like you and me. Not yet the Prince of Wales, young Charles was known by his subsidiary names alone. It was as the mere Duke of Cornwall then that he, plus his small escort of armed men, arrived so unobtrusively to start the new term at Hill House. Set in the heart of Knightsbridge, from now on this institution drew crowds as if a public execution were taking place inside it every day, which was just what was happening in a way, since Charles soon found his struggle to fit in was the one battle he could never win. The fight was lost before the fight began, and he must spend his life as a marked man. Great-grandma died, which left him short of friends at court, the kind on which a chap depends if that chap's mother happens to be queen, with not much time left over from routine. His sister Anne's arrival was a plus, although there wasn't much one could discuss with her as yet. Anne thought it a good game to crawl backwards and forwards past the same poor sentry till he'd wrecked himself saluting, and when he fell face down she'd crawl off hooting. Charles disapproved, but Anne, unlike her brother, was like her father more than like her mother, impulsive. Nonetheless, she came in handy to divert press attention, as did Randy when he arrived. So full marks to the stalk, but still it was a long and lonely walk to school, and when they switched the school to Cheem, his waking hours became one long bad dream, since every living soul except the press shunned him to prove how they could not care less that he would one day sit upon the throne. Just one more thing he'd have to do alone. One finds... He mused. What makes it hard for one is that one can't complain. It isn't done. Made glum beyond his years by such grim thoughts, he ferried home a clutch of school reports which showed his general progress to be small, and maths he simply could not do at all. His pocket money, which did not amount to much, he couldn't really even count, since any coin resembled any other. They all seemed to be portraits of his mother. When Tony, Earl of Nikon, came to visit the school, he kindly said... Not easy, is it? The minute that I married your mum's sister, I started missing, being just plain mister. At least, though, I once knew what it was like. But as for you, you'll never know, poor Tyke. Your parents sent you this. It was a boat, the one he'd asked for. Smallest boat afloat on the school pond, it wanly dipped along, while Charles kept to himself his sense of wrong. But in his letters home, the odd pale blot tipped off the Queen that things were not so hot. It troubles us to see our son and heir, she pondered, in the grip of such despair. 
This letter strikes us as a cry of pain. It looks as if it's been out in the rain. The Duke stared through the window at the pink stretch of the mall and had a quiet think. Soon make a man of him at Gordonson, said Philip with a lightening of his frown. Cold bath, a bit of PT, climb a cliff naked at night. If they don't like it, biff, touch the rope's end or the old belt buckle about the bum. Good crack across the knuckle works wonders. When they find out that it hurts to hang on, they let go of Mummy's skirts damned quick. Shouldn't take long to break him in. But first, we'll have to stiffen up that chin. At this, Her Majesty looked apprehensive. Cosmetic surgery was still expensive in those days, and there had been certain cases of people coming out of it with faces worse than they had gone in with. The Duchess of Marlborough before last. A frightful mess. Well, yes, the Queen sighed. We suppose we must allow it. Is there someone we can trust? The short list Philip held held just one name. Christian Barnyard had not yet soared to fame, nor would he till he first transplanted hearts. But having cut his teeth on other parts, already he was known in certain quarters as one who could change ugly duckling daughters to swans by simply shuffling certain bits. And many a great chatelaine now sits on pads of flesh that elsewhere on her torso once made her look like Mae West only more so. Clinics in Zurich. Might as well get him. Prince Philip rasped. To give Anne's nose a trim. Two birds, one stone. We'll pack them off tonight. And off he went to line up the Queen's flight. A heron left Bryce Norton after dark. Both Charles and Anne thought this a terrific lark. They liked the secrecy, that precious stuff of which they never seemed to get enough, although, of course, they were not yet aware that all their lives it would grow still more rare. But now they drowsed, and then they fell asleep, and by and by their sleep grew very deep, as Barnyard stood above them in his mask and delicately set about his task. Go easy, son, he told himself. One slip, and back we go to Africa by ship. Might even have to walk. Here's the first slice. And there's the cartilage. Yes, that looks nice. The end of Anne's nose with a little sore, he cut off and transferred to Charles's jaw. Brilliantly simple, but it all took hours. What taxed him to the limit of his powers was putting in the thousand tiny stitches. Even today, when Anne's lost tissue itches, Charles scratches it to soothe the phantom lesion left by the adjunct's method of adhesion. But really, since the scars are subcutaneous, to raise these minor quibbles is extraneous. Success was overwhelming from the first. The Queen, prepared as always for the worst, took one look at the poor bruised black and blue facades of her two darlings, and she knew that they would heal into a fresh perfection. The interfering hand defied detection. We are very pleased, Her Majesty declared, to see these irritating faults repaired. A blemished royal profile rather cramps the style of those chaps who design the stamps. Now, Charles, barked Philip, when you get to school, for Christ's sake, please observe this golden rule, or else you might be on a sticky wicket. By all means, rub your new chin, but don't pick it. Good luck, dear, said the Queen. Oh, by the way, we've made you Prince of Wales, as from today. <laughs> Book three. The heron vanished southward, leaving only the North Sea cliffs, a small boy looking lonely, and tall beside him, tanned by wind and sun, the principal of Gordonston, Kraut Hun. You still fly scoot, your father, Hun declared. Best boy I ever had here, never scared. One time I towed his whole class out to sea and told them to swim home in time for tea. He was the only one got back alive. Maybe he ate the others. We survive by learning to look danger in the face. That way we purify the human race. I see from the report they sent from Chim, they made you captain of the soccer team the only year it never scored a goal. Forget all that. I teach you self-control. We start right now. You see that row of huts? That is the school. Let's see if you got guts. 
The path we're on is booby-trapped and mined, so you go first. I won't be far behind. Charles gulped, but set off bravely through the maze of tripwires glinting in the evening haze. The compound was surrounded by a moat. You had to cross it in a rubber boat, which gradually deflated as you paddled. Charles found his noble brain becoming addled, but clung hard to a log, which only later revealed itself to be an alligator. By that time, though, the prince was home and dry, and being shown the dorm. A little cry of fear escaped him when he saw his bed. Was this where he must lay his royal head? From now on, sneered Krauthan, you sleep on nails. An Indian idea which never fails, to keep the drowser free from dreams of loose behavior, not to mention self-abuse, which, should he even try it, he would tend to make a waffle iron of his rear end. Not that your highness ever would be tempted. Such urges are, however, best preempted. You sleep now. In the morning, a cold shower, and then fall in near the machine gun tower. Next day on the assault course, poor Charles found that being Prince of Wales gained him no ground. Quite the reverse. His classmates did their best to make a torment out of every test. They double-greased the ropes from which he swung. They half-soared through the rungs to which he clung. He wiped his nose and found it running blood. He sighed and spat a mouthful of cold mud. And all this before breakfast, after which they playfully tossed him into a ditch. His hair all spud peel, gravy and sweet corn, he surfaced wishing he had not been born, but instantly despair turned to resolve. With heart and heart he vowed he would involve himself in all the manly pastimes going, determined he would make a decent showing. One simply must, he mused, accept one's fate. One can't expect the whole thing on a plate. One simply has to learn to grin and bear it. It's just a case of if the crime fits, wear it. Impressed, they helped him bathe and change, and then they picked him up and threw him in again. Thus wise the months of pain turned into years, with every night spent on his nails in tears. But no one ever heard a single sob, as doggedly he got on with the job. On visits home, not one word of complaint escaped his lips, although he felt quite faint with envy at Anne's licensed concentration on the minutiae of equitation. The few meals she did not take in the stable, she fed her ponies at the dinner table, while Randy in a pedal car gave chase to every female servant in the place. The palace rang with his horn and Anne's hoot, while Charles sat glum, save when Jane Wellyboot dropped in to see him in his beetle wig. He writhed and strummed. The act went over big with her at least. She'd tap her foot and clap. This sort of girl appreciates a chap, thought Charles. If only one could stay down here and make mass entertainment one's career and be a goon and sing the Yin Tong song and tour the world and Jane could come along. But back flew Charles each time to the far north, that fearful frith beyond the Firth of Forth, that landscape of bald rocks and slimy crags, the home of shagged-out clams and clapped-out shags. I think that's a rhetorical device I've just used. Anyway, it felt quite nice. By now, Charles had attained the dizzy rank of guardian, for which he had to thank his own tenacity and Hun's belief in heaping hardship on a future chief. In other words, the lonely little bleeder who once had looked so lost was now a leader, responsible for stroking home his crew and all the other things that leaders do. Charles felt more trapped than ever, so no wonder he led his lads into a frightful blunder. Fog caught them on the cliffs. A pub was handy. Hot drinks all round. His was a cherry brandy. The place of sin looked cut off by the mist. Inside, however, sat a journalist who watched Charles drain his glass and set it down and then got on the telephone to town. A storm blew up that never quite blew out. The whole world talked about his drinking bout. For Fleet Street, the event was heaven sent. They flogged the cherry brandy incident for all that it was worth which was, of course, nothing at all, since even a dead horse must first have lived. The tabloid press, however, makes up with crassness for not being clever. The billboards went berserk week after week. Charles was called home, but found the prospect bleak. One couldn't face the mater or the pater. Not in the circus, he muttered. Perhaps later. Just now one simply couldn't stand the quarrel. 
Meanwhile, one's grandmother is at Belmore. That night, the young prince dodged from hut to hut between the searchlight beams and deftly cut his way out through the wire. He swam the moat and scampered through the minefields like a goat. We'll take a break now. Join us again in a few moments. Next day, he and his grandmother caught trout almost as fast as they could pull them out. Fly fishing was the Queen Mum's favourite sport, and all she had to teach, Charles had been taught. They stood knee-deep in water so like air, only the ripples told you it was there. The fish flew through it inches off the ground and shuttled back and forth before they found a fly to swallow. It was suicide. Nevertheless, they died pop-eyed with pride. My bet was one, and you look like another, too human for the job, said the Queen Mother. But niceness doesn't get you off the hook. Remember, though, you are the way you look. You've got the acting talent. Half the art of being royal is to play the part. Start off by putting strangers at their ease with royal opening remarks like these. Have you come far? They always like that one. And always ask how many years they've done whatever thing they do the whole day long. Your hands behind you and you can't go wrong. Pretend to be a prince. Your grandpa wept when David did a bunk, but he still kept the bargain. Not that he had any choice, and he had nothing like as good a voice as you have. Chin up, he that plays the king will one day be the king, the plays the thing. The annual Shakespeare play put on at school most often featured Prince Charles as the fool. But now, in his last year, he snared a role appropriate to his unfolding soul. It was Macbeth. He practised by the hour the talk and walk and look of kingly power. He strode around with hands behind his back endeavouring to cultivate the knack of looking like somebody to be feared, despite a cardboard sword and crepe hair beard. The night arrived and he was pretty good. Hands clasped behind, he greeted Burnham Wood. Have you come far? He asked in royal fashion, but Banquo's spectre most aroused his passion. How long? He queried. Have you been a guest? The Queen and Duke were there. Don't like to boast, hissed Philip. But the boy's a treat to watch. Let's hope he doesn't take a swig of scotch. He's copied me. Tell by the way he stands. I like that thing he's doing with his hand. We must say we're impressed. The Queen concurred. We're hanging on our offspring's every word. The line that might have drawn unwanted laughter. All hail Macbeth, that shall be king hereafter. Aroused a cough or two, but nothing worse. Such is the grandeur of the bard's blank verse. Book four. Although his place at Cambridge was well earned, some subtle things young Charles had not yet learned. His parents thought he needed finishing. But at what school? At this point in stalked Ming, Sir Robert Gordon Mensroom of Australia, Knight of the Thistle, Grand Duke of the Dahlia, and Lord High Gladioli. Silver tongue, still working well and portly poitrine hung, with all the chains and tokens that denoted a warden of the sink plug, Ming emoted thus wise. Your Majesties, if you'll permit the liberty, I'll gladly do my bit to help you give young Charles that final burnish even the finest diamond needs. We furnish at our great school called Timbertop facilities 
not only to bring out a boy's abilities, but to impart that quintessential air compounded of sang Freud and savoir faire, which in my country always has surrounded those few by whom the many are astounded. Myself, for instance. Note the self-assured hauteur by which my enemies are floored, the gloss which to the voters means so much, and yet I never lose my common touch. Exemplifying democratic ease, Ming mouthed this whole oration on his knees, and ever and anon bent down and kissed the royal slipper, which he sometimes missed, whereat the stippled Wilton met his lips, and had its nap sucked up in little sips. The Queen and Duke across his bobbing stern exchanged a glance which he could not discern, but which he otherwise might have construed as tempering disgust with gratitude. We think the scheme ideal, announced the Queen. The Duke agreed. Must say I'm bloody keen. He needs that cool, no-nonsense kind of poise he'll only get when he's one of the boys. That's why the Aussies make such good equerries. They're arrogant as frogs and fight like jerrys. While this was being said, Ming was still bowing, salaming, genuflecting and kowtowing. They tactfully suggested he efface himself. Discovering yet more ways to abase himself, he backed off down the long reception room and slowly disappeared into the gloom of history's Antipodean annex. The next man to be shown in wore a Ganex and smoked a pipe. His name was Harold Wiles, Prime Minister of Britain. Ghastly smiles of bogus welcome strained the royal features, inspired by this most déclassé of creatures. Let me be frank, Wiles said, about your son. No, please don't interrupt, I've just begun. The coal board would be more than pleased if he could follow the example set by me and join them as a prestige figurehead. You handle this, Prince Philip bluntly said and left his wife to cope while he got started on helping Charles to pack. The prince departed within the hour aboard the prototype Concorde, which, like a cinematic wipe, translated him abruptly round the planet. The trip stopped opposite where he began it, and out he fell to find the bright sky filled by Gaff and Mrs. Lamewit. We're real thrilled you're giving Timbertop a bell, your grace, said Gaff, because it's a bonza little place. Allow me to present my lady wife. The sheltered Charles had never in his life seen anyone to equal these two giants, whose monumental stature baffled science. Their heads were usually obscured by cloud, but not today, for now they gently bowed and reached down to squeeze Charles's tiny hand and make him welcome to the great South Land. Give us a tinkle if you want to feed, said Mrs. Lamewit. Looks as if you need a bit of building up. You off your tucker? Here comes a kiss. Charles saw her great lips pucker, but had not time to move aside before he felt himself sucked upward with a roar. His head began to spin and did not stop revolving till he got to Timbertop. The bouncing of the litter brought him to, in time to be astonished by the view of mountain peaks protruding through the mist sent up by breathing tree ferns. From one wrist he plucked a leech, and from one ear another, and gulped wet air and felt that he might smother. The native bearers set him crudely down beside a bark hut. In a dressing gown and sand shoes, with his face as yet half shaved, a hulking brute who looked like a depraved prize fighter shambled out and growled, Good day. I hope them boons weren't too rough on the way. Name's Kerry Packmule. Glad to have you here. I'm captain of the school. You want a beer? Your grace is hereby welcomed to Down Under. Charles is a poofter name. I'll call you Chanda. Despite his more than 20 years at school, on certain subjects, Kerry was no fool. He showed young Charles the art of chopping wood and kept him at it till he understood. The white chips flew, the heap of wood grew high, while Kerry stretched out on a stump nearby and dreamed aloud of plans to make the game of cricket less traditionally tame. The day that my old man drops off the twig, mused Kerry, I'll be on to something big as far as cash goes. Struth, the Pope's a Jew if I can't blew all that on something new. The whole game needs a good kick up the arse, combined with my good taste and touch of class. At this point, Charles froze. Prostrate on a branch, a creature lay whose aspect made him blanch. 
Its scaly skin had a metallic sheen. Its length and pulsing plumpness were obscene. Its blue tongue fluttered like a battle banner. Relax, said Kerry. Only a goanna. Don't worry about lizards, for Christ's sake. But if it's got no legs, then it's a snake. Like that one near your foot. You'd be a wreck if he got onto you. Hold on a sec. While Kerry lazily picked up an axe, Charles had a series of small heart attacks. He closed his eyes and heard the sudden whistle of metal and the crunch of severed gristle, and then a yell from Kerry. Shit a brick! You'd better get those toes sewn back on quick! Charles spent the next week in the matron's tent and found out what Australia really meant in terms of insect life. Beset by flies and fleas, he lay there uttering weak cries of anguish, which were lost among the noise, kicked up by all the other suffering boys who lay around him. No one else, in fact, apart from Kerry, had survived intact a single term. The school's whole population had been reduced to some form of prostration, most often brought about by living things which came equipped with hypodermic stings. One boy who'd fallen in a bull ant's nest was understandably a bit obsessed. A fortnight later, he was still hysterical, his throbbing body absolutely spherical. Another boy had put on his slouch hat, but had not, until too late, noticed that the hat contained the sort of centipede which hates confinement very much indeed. Before they started bandaging his head, he first had to be buckled to the bed. Yet Charles preferred the scene, although infernal, inside the tent to anything external, for outside lay yet more of the same feral and floral focal points of painful peril that had reduced him to his present state. Suave Kerry reassured him. Listen, mate, no worries. Just be careful in the dunny. A red back up your arsehole isn't funny, believe me. Charles believed him, but evinced a certain vagueness, even as he winced. One's not quite certain what a redback does, he ventured. Does it hum or does it buzz? Good truth, cried Kerry. Don't come the raw prawn. You pommy poofters hardly know you're born. Redbacks are spiders. Get one up your bum, you'll more than likely end up deaf and dumb. So always take a deco down the pan before you drop your strides. That's if you can. You can't if it's too dark, but then the redback is blind too. You can sit there with your head back and look up at the stars all night and dream of picking Kerry Packmule's cricket team. I think I'll go there now and squat. Feel free to come and have a mag. That's where I'll be. Grateful for Kerry's visit, Charles declined the offer, but the thought was on his mind. The night wore on while he fought off the urge to go forth in the dark and stage a purge. By rights, the thought of Kerry's redback warning should have postponed his promptings until morning. Alas, his disciplined digestive tract for once was restively resolved to act. With spiders rife in his imagination, he groped and stumbled through the vegetation until he bumped into the rough-hewn seat of what he sought. With trousers round his feet, he strove to quell the visions in his mind of spiders poised to jump up his behind, but soothingly a soft voice from close by drew his attention to the brilliant sky in which each constellation was a cluster of diamonds reveling in its own luster. Pendants and brooches, necklaces and sprays all overlapped in one triumphant blaze. Them stars up there have got what I want. Light. I'll bung my cricket matches on at night. I'll paint the balls black and the stumps and bales a nice bright red to match the players' nails. Crash helmets will protect the head and face and also provide advertising space by means of small revolving neon signs promoting leading brands of beers and wines. The batsman's boxes will have pink propellers. The wicketkeeper will be Peter Sellers. The umpires will wear tutus and high heels. I might replace them with performing seals. I'm sick of this place, Chunder. Let's shoot through at Sparrow's Fart. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll hitch a lift to Melbourne and then fly to Sydney and go surfing at Bondi. This book has had an excremental theme so far, and though Bondi looked like a dream of sun and sparkling water and clean air, I fear the boys were not free even there from cloacal preoccupations. Lumps of faecal matter floated, forming clumps, which rose like rafts into the booming breakers to be distributed through foaming acres. The sewage came from further up the coast, 
Charles staggered out the colour of pot roast. The mayor of Bondi had arrived to meet him, but Charles gave that poor man no time to greet him. One might as well be swimming in the loo, said Charles. One's very deeply in the poo. If we'd known you was coming, you mug lair, we would have stopped the pumps, averred the mayor. Now don't, snapped Charles, come the raw prawn with me. Just get in there and clean that flaming sea. While mayor and corporation armed with spade and bucket made a dutiful parade of purifying the putrescent ocean, young Kerry gazed at Charles with deep emotion. You've come on, Chunder, he announced with awe. In no time you'll be laying down the law to all them poofters you was born to rule. I reckon this is your last day of school. Two friends whose paths through life must shortly part. The silent boys shook hands with heavy heart. They stood picked out in solemn silhouette. Against the sea the sun lit as it set. A hot pink disc that hissed with a terrific finality into the cool Pacific. In Cambridge, there was only one front gate, fit to receive a future head of state. To Trinity belongs the proudest portal that ever made a man feel merely mortal. The painted scutcheons poised above the doors make you inclined to enter on all fours. They boast of John of Gaunt and the Black Prince, and almost everyone before or since who ever led crusades or conquered France, or would have done if he had had the chance. By now, with his new aura of authority, a candidate to join this bold minority, Prince Charles, with movements languid but effective, accompanied by his alert detective, stepped from his car before his new front door. Two thousand frantic pressmen with a roar converged on him and bore him to the ground. The poor detective still has not been found to this day. That young Charles survived the scrum was no mean tribute to his newer plum. Inside the gate, Lord Butterball stood smiling, a manatee's attempt to look beguiling. Between the jowls and just above the chins, the mouth curved in the weakest of weak grins. Beneath the lower eyelids, puffs and sags of flesh formed matching sets of battered bags. But nothing really touched the eyes themselves for soulfulness. They wobbled on their shelves like water-filled balloons. A silent bleat of longing for a lost Ten Downing Street. His gaze remembered how old Mac McHack had somehow crept around behind his back and with one piercing blow had sealed his doom. And that was how Sir Ancient Stately Hume became Prime Minister, while Butterball, his expectations dished beyond recall, dragged his slow girth to this great seat of learning for years of walnuts, port and pointless yearning. But one good part was still left to be played, which gained from being played out in the shade, the role of moral tutor to the prince. The prince was gladly testing out the chintz armchairs in the first room he'd ever known, where he could count on being left alone instead of merely lonely, which is not quite the same thing by any length of shot. It did the world of good to sport his oak, get dressed for bed and have a quiet smoke. Night fell. With happy weariness imbued, he sat enjoying his new solitude. Just then he saw the most amazing thing vaguely occur amongst the panelling. Without a sound, a door-shaped void had yawned, in which Lord Butterball now stood and fawned, the bubble on his nightcap hanging down below the hem of his drab dressing gown, while lower still his ancient leather slippers were so worn they looked like a pair of kippers. Useful device. Through this I can appear, and nobody will know that I've been here, to give you what informed support I can in my capacity as grand old man. I framed the education act, you know. That's why you're here. Pity it had to go, the world as it once was, but there you are. Or rather, here you are. You keep a car? One understood that cars were not allowed, said Charles, a bit awed, not to mention cowed. Hang on to yours, said Butterball. We'll bend the rules a bit. Look on me as a friend. Two years from now, you'll sit for your degree in anthro-what's-it-archopology. 
Till then, there's time for broadening the mind by access to the best brands you can find. Some are in Oxford, but we'll bring them to you. I'm feeling a bit tired. You don't mind, do you? Lord Butterball crept into Charles's bed. His snores were loud enough to wake the dead. By morning, Charles was numb from lack of sleep, and truth to tell, he thought it a bit steep that he should be so ill-prepared to face the fastest talker that the human race possessed, Oxford's Professor Freddie Spare. At 9 a.m. precisely, Spare was there in Charles's doorway and already talking, something he also did while he was walking or lying down or, so the story went, bestowing the most heartfelt compliment a brain like his could pay to femininity, the fleshly act of spiritual affinity. Good, good. You've got your pen and paper ready. But what does good mean? Asked Professor Freddy. The pen and paper we can verify, or anyway, I can. But who am I? Or rather, what am I? Ghost or machine? Must you be here to find out what I mean? Who are you, incidentally? Rings a bell, that face of yours? I know that face quite well. I had lunch with the Queen last week. Relation? She fancied me, of course. That information is strictly between us, you understand. I felt her shiver when I kissed her hand, poor creature. But what do we mean by feel if we do not mean no? Are feelings real? Well, come on, come on, come on, try, I guess. Think, think, that's it, you're thinking. Yes, 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 it's trembling on your tongue. Speak, speak, lad, speak. Alas, time's up. Mustache, same time next week. And in the doorway which had featured Freddy was nothing but an eerie, airy eddy. But no respite. A bell struck ten past nine and punctually appeared the next in line. His name was Rayon Woolens, come to teach some form of politics. Earnest of speech, in mode of dress he was no whit less grim. The trendy left could lay no claim to him. His leftness harked back to an older school, as stubborn as a mule and grey as gruel, a stagnant pool of glutinous viscosity where failed polemics foundered in pomposity. You represent a ruling class attempt, droned Woolens, to behave as if exempt from social thrusts by which manipulation becomes habitual to the population. And yet you form, in fact, part of the flow by which a given television show resembles any other. On he cantered of how the helpless masses are implanted with standard patterns of response, and yet to Charles it seemed of all the men he'd met that this man's patterns of response were more standard than anything he'd heard before, as well as tedious beyond belief. The bell, thank goodness, kept the session brief. Off shuffled Woolens in his roll-neck sweater to write a book and thus make the world better. The pedagogue's parade went on and on, as each few minutes dawn succeeded dawn, while Charles took notes with scarcely time to munch the sandwich he was sent in lieu of lunch. Professor Israel Blintz appeared before him, and instantly such waves of verbiage bore him backwards into the room that he at first thought some enormous water main had burst. In point of fact, Blintz had just said hello, but here was Woolen's daft idea of flow, made actual in one man, whose every word was joined to the word after. Thus you heard a verbal seamless garment, consonants piled up so fast they left vowels little chance to breathe, and poor Prince Charles no chance at all, as he stood pinned by sound waves to the wall. Kerensky thought to be a constitution, but Bolsheviks believed in revolution, for Lenin liberalism was chief threat, terror the means by which threat must be met. At last, however, Blintz was bumped aside by one who was exceptionally wide for one so small. She puffed up like a quail and spoke like a canary in a gale. Dame Helen Gardenome, for all her laudable intelligence, is scarcely even audible. She drops so many names they form a heap, but what you mainly hear is... Cheek, cheek, cheek. When Tom was cheek, cheek, writing for quartet, he told me the cheek one forgets. Not that Marcel cheek, cheek, forgot a thing, but then that was his thing, remembering. Poor Robert, how he missed Elizabeth. He never quite got 
cheap her death. I helped him cut Saltello twice as long initially. Where John cheap cheap went wrong was publishing La Belle Dame Sans Merci before he'd shown the manuscript to me. Same thing, cheap cheap, with William. Half the plot of Hamlet, cheap cheap cheap, is Tommy Rot. He wouldn't listen, stood cheap looking dense, as if cheap I was saying made no sense. But Jeffrey couldn't cheap have cheap more sweet. Cheap, cheap, tweet, twitter, twitter, tweet, tweet, tweet. By this time day was done and Charles was too. He listened to the last dons in the queue with heavy eyes. AJP Tailspin came and went, and poor Charles would have felt the same if he'd not come at all, since what he had to say was all so brilliant it was mad. If Albert Schweitzer had been Chancellor of Germany, there still would have been war, said Tailspin while his tie gaily revolved. The situation had to be resolved, and Mussolini, Führer of the Reich, resolved it, using methods not unlike Hitler's in Italy. Meanwhile, in Russia, Deladier, like Sun Yat-sen in Prussia, was finishing what Gladstone had begun. Is this where I switch back to camera one? Charles couldn't tell if Tailspin was insane or he himself had suffered a strained brain. My mother has asked me to express her good wishes and invite you to join us again shortly. He rolled his oak shut with his last reserves of strength and poured a drink to calm his nerves. Dusk gathered in the window leads. He dressed for bed and on his gas ring cooked the best meal he could manage. Most of it was stew, brewed from a tin of the cubed kangaroo his old friend Kerry sent him by the crate. At last he lay down. It was very late. So he at first was not delighted when he saw the secret panel gape again. He blinked. A woman of some kind stood there, attired in what must be lace underwear. Another don, he guessed. What did she teach? She looked all plump and juicy, like a peach. Perhaps she taught gymnastics. Something physical. He sat up feeling strange and looking quizzical. Lord Butterball sends you his compliments, the girl announced. Should you be feeling tense, he thinks perhaps a massage might relax those knotted muscles. Yes, you see, your back's all tight. Let's rub it. <gasps> So's your neck and chest. So it appeared was nearly all the rest. My name is Countess Princess Lulubel, La Bombe di Prosciutto Kunstwerkdel, Annunziata Cheeseburger Van Fleet, Archduchess of Koblenz and Ancient Crete. Just call me Lulu. <gasps> no, you put that here, not there. I think you'll find that that's my ear. One likes this subject very much indeed, sighed Charles. One thinks this is the one to read. <laughs> it isn't on the course, breathed Lulu. Now, shut up a minute while I show you how. She showed him. Using all her tactile skill, she put her willing pupil through the mill. He groaned and giggled, wriggled and revolved. He writhed, rotated, dithered and dissolved. The heir apparent to the British crown spent half the evening hanging upside down. Without quite knowing what all this was for, the weary Charles kept coming back for more. At last, with few clues what it was about, but well content, he quietly passed out. A new taste on his young tongue as he dreamed, and in his sleep he licked his lips and beamed. Book six. 
One day of Charles's life just took a book. Excessive, but we had to take a look in detail at his hurricane induction into the apparatus of instruction. Now we can skip a bit. No need to dwell on how the leaves turn brown before they fell, and how around the library built by Wren the lawns turned white and then turned green again, as calico that's first bleached and then dyed spreads the more smoothly, being mollified. The seasons came and went. That's no great news. I'd show more tactlessness than you'd excuse if I should add that once you've seen them do it in Cambridge, then you know there's much more to it than physical phenomena arranging themselves in changeless sequences of changing. The fructive breath of spring, for instance, brings the girls out floating past the back of kings like sprays of lilies, drifting punt by punt, polled by some spotty and straw-boated runt, they part the water-kissing willow tree, past Clare and Tit Hall down to Trinity. Charles saw such fragrant boatloads gliding by, and thought how much he'd like to have a try. No hope, for Fleet Street would be on the scene, by hydrofoil and midget submarine, before he'd so much as put in his pole. He'd have to stick to polo on the whole. He sighed and turned and sat down with his cello to bow a simple melody but mellow, suggesting, with its elementary purity, the bitterness beneath his new maturity. The average undergraduate could waste his time in any way that met his taste. Not so the Prince of Wales, who was denied a space to breathe in or a place to hide. One night he and his armed guards got back late and found the bolt shot on the college gate. Good show. One's always wanted to climb in, said Charles with an expectant, moonlit grin. He led his bodyguard, enjoined to caution, off through the dark to find the hallowed portion of wall where gentlemen by long tradition affected a discreet late-night transition from outside where cold proctors lay in wait to inside where hot coals lay in the grate. Charles rubbed his chill hands and got set to climb, but did no more than that before his time ran out. A battery of floodlights blazed, so brilliantly the flintstone walls looked glazed. Sirens went off, bells chimed. A two-ton van drew up from which men vaulted and began assembling with amazing speed a flight of marble stairs that climbed through the white night to where Lord Butterball stood on the roof, shaking his august head in fond reproof, while various attendants and divines made gestures on the same indulgent lines. A plush red carpet unrolled down the stairs. Charles mounted heavy-hearted while fanfares of welcome were unleashed from trumpets long and straight and unrelenting in their song of triumph. Thus the heralds cracked their cheeks while Charles feared this might all go on for weeks and wake up everyone for fifty miles. So much for his big night out on the tiles. But there was more. A mighty thwack, thwack, thwack was heard from high up where the sky was black. A helicopter settled into view, engorged with a whole television crew, commanded by Des Coxcomb. Man alive, he queried, asks, how can Prince Charles survive a life spent subject to such scrutiny? To help us put that question, here with me is Esther Hotpants. Esther, it's your cue. Well, Des, drawled Esther, I agree with you. I think that all this fuss is pretty mad. Well, look at him cowering there. He's just a lad. A baby like this one I'm holding here. But that's it. Drink up your milk now. There's a dear. Her breast and teeth bared like a mock Madonna, she sat aloft with every eye upon her, while Des, like a new Joseph, drunk with pride, crouched signing checks and contracts at her side, and all below looked up with ruffled hair to see them in their element, the air, a holy family held up by a hook you can't quite see however hard you look. Indeed, such is that couple's awesome power, I brought them on ere their appointed hour to symbolize by this conquest of space and time their unexampled state of grace. From that day forth, when Prince Charles walked abroad, he had the wherewithal to be ignored. His escort would position a dustbin, and Charles, should the press threaten, would climb in, thus finding some brief respite from his plight. The dustbin achieved fame in its own right. At one stage, a well-known front-bench MP 
Today, it's chairman of the BBC. Charles also found it useful when he spoke in public to unleash a royal joke, another way of hiding, since a jest of all means of concealment is the best. The final term approached. To celebrate, Charles asked his people up to dine in state chez lui on food prepared with his own hand on his own gas ring. The occasion, if not grand, was intimate. Prince Philip and the Queen sat on the couch. Perched on the fire screen was Uncle Dicky, fully decorated. Brass bound, steel lined, gold studded, silver plated, beplumed, bejeweled, emblazoned, and embossed, with no thought for the weight or count for cost, he was impervious to all attack, except, as we have since learned, from the back. The Earl of Nikon squatted on the floor while Princess Margaret hovered near the door, as if she would have rather been elsewhere, where palm trees waved and salt spray thrilled the air, the mystique-ridden island of Mustique, where always it's the middle of next week, and young men make a fetish of the body, and sing an answer to the name of Roddy. Anne, having left her horse somewhere outside, had found a fat chair arm to sit astride, which made her look a little bit less bandy, while in the chair itself lolled the suave Randy. The Queen Mum was there too, as were the Kents and Ogilvies. It was, to all intents and purposes, a gathering of the clan, part one of Uncle Dickie's master plan for making Charles a national sinusure by means of a slap-up investiture. While Charles dished up a steaming vindaloo of curried rice plus Kerry's kangaroo, his uncle with a tintinabulation of medals sketched a combined operation to equal his campaigns in the Far East, except the total cost would be increased. There's something going on that I don't like, he growled. The other side of offers dyke. Welsh, we're getting restive. Time to prove we care before the swine get on the move. Carnarvon, that's the spot. You see this map? A ceremony. Tony's just a chap to do the flocks. Charles, learn the local lingo. Those leak eaters will go for it like bingo. The Queen, with a sour look, put down her fork. We understand that there has been some talk of bombs and things. We are not having that. We are keeping him in England, and that's flat. But Charles demurred. This is one's final term. From now on, one must serve the family firm. The boy's right, snapped the Duke. He's come of age. His place is on the international stage. It isn't in the kitchen, that's for sure. What is this bloody stuff? I'll have some more, the Queen Mum said. Charles heaped food on her platter, while square-jawed Uncle Dicky clinched the matter. There's no way out of the Prince of Wales and hide. The tiger that he rides, rides with pride. Or not. Ride the way, he can't dismount. Someone's tried it, but he doesn't count. Now let's get going on the invitations. Full speed ahead, no prisoners, action stations. His epaulets lit up. The silver stars, massed on his chest, spun round like bumper cars, while in amongst them other kinds of gong prismatically shed sparks, or else went bong, kapwing, clang clang, zing zing, and rat tat tat, and streams of bubbles jetted from his hat. On that theme, there was no more to be heard. The family strategist had said the word. Book seven. The dawning day of his investiture found Prince Charles apprehensive and unsure. Not that he feared the cloaked assassin's hand. What scared him was his tenuous command of Welsh which he had studied till his brain had turned to tapioca from the strain, with scant result. The few words he had mastered created the impression he was plastered. A team of druids was convened to teach the prince the fundamentals of their speech. Have you come far? He asked them. They had not. Nor did his other question help a lot. How long have you been wearing those white sheets? They smoothed their seams and rearranged their pleats and burbled on remorselessly in tones that made them sound like mice with megaphones while Charles strove might and main to comprehend. They all played harps. They drove him round the bend. Eventually, no time was left. Depressed, Charles started the long job of getting dressed. A pair of velvet knickerbockers tied below the knee with silk ropes at each side, a tunic made entirely of gold braid, 
an arctic mink cape lined with pink brocade, a pearl-encrusted platinum top hat with Prince of Wales plumes perched on top of that. All these went on in turn, until at last, with flies all buttoned up and flaps made fast, he eased himself into his high-heeled shoes and climbed onto his penny farthing. Cues of druids in full livery lined the route. Their harps went plunk, strange-looking pipes went toot, while on the castle lawn the family firm was gathered in such strength it made Charles squirm with nervousness, lest he let down the side, and yet inside his head the gap yawned wide where his great speech in Welsh was meant to be, and out there further than the eye could see were Welshmen standing shoulder to cold shoulder, uphill, down dale, and perched on every boulder. With quailing heart he climbed down from his bike, and climbed the white stairs to the waiting Mike. The stairs were made of fiberglass. They led up to a plastic platform overhead and down again, while fountains played and lines of dancing girls fleshed out Nikon's designs. Charles stood outlined against a brooding cloud and nervously stared down into the crowd. In unalloyed despair he searched his mind, and not a single Welsh word could he find. He felt as if cross wires were centred on him. Then sudden inspiration came upon him. In tongue, he ventured. In tongue, little I po, prestetin, aberystwyth, landed no. Who oh, am the famous actor? Henry, maiden, blibato, major blood knock, grid pipe thin. Yes, folks, it's Nelly Seagorn. Hip, hooray. Kermarthen, Merthyr Tidville, Corwin Blay. The Welsh were overwhelmed. Such eloquence, a blend of poetry and common sense, the likes of which they'd seldom heard before. The Druids shivered, shaken to the core. David Ap Gwilym had not in his prime shown Charles's gift for metre, tone and rhyme. He spoke their language as if born to lead them. Why, if they wrote him poems, he would read them. The prospect dazzled. All fell there and then to frantic plying of the bardic pen, while as a background to the scratch of quills, such roars of adoration shook the hills as were not heard when Gareth Edwards scored his tenth try of the day. Charles' spirits soared. His people loved him. At a prearranged signal from Nikon, the stage picture changed. The platform cut loose from the curving stair and silently moved forward through the air. While Charles stood imperturbably upright, induction motors powered his eerie flight. Born onward in a kind of mobile stasis, he passed above a sea of upturned faces, upon which reigned a cataract of quips and quiddities formed by his royal lips. He traced a giant circle round the town, and even as dusk fell did not come down, for Nikon's flares and rockets lit the sky, so brightly Charles was plain to every eye, until the moment when he altered course for London, and like some triumphant horse, who rounds the final turn into the strait, and tilting upright lets its stride grow great, he gathered speed so that his plumes blew back and dwindled to a dot. The sky grew black, reluctantly. A lone flare slowly fell, but in a short while that was gone as well, and all the royals climbed into their cars, and nothing lit the night except the stars. Book eight. The Royal Navy claimed the Prince of Wales. The salt air heard the snap of swollen sails, he grew a beard more vigorous than neat. He learned to ply an oar and reef a sheet and sheet a reef. Far out of sight of land, he learned first to obey and then command. Swab out the jib, he cried. All poops abaft. Lash down the foreskin and belay that shaft. His minesweeper went cruising in the med. It found no mines to sweep, and so instead it sailed around the world to Hollywood, where Charles met Barbara stress band. You look good in that tuxedo, Chuck. Know what I mean? Make sure you call me when they make you queen. She led him off into a whirlwind dance. Next day the whole world talked of their romance, but Charles had slipped away. Far out at sea, he pondered his unyielding destiny. 
He dived on a deep wreck to find doubloons, but solitude eluded him. Platoons of other divers came down just behind him and circled round as if sent to remind him he was a treasure never to remain, unguarded for an hour. Was it the pain of pressure in his ears that made him wince when he came up? The next stop for the prince was Sandhurst, where he rose up from the ranks until in no time he was driving tanks. Leaving aside the fact it doesn't float, a tank is not that different from a boat, so it was no surprise that Charles should make the odd foray into a pond or lake. There seems to be... He sighed. ...mud in one's gun. How frightfully embarrassing for one. One rather thought one was still sweeping mines. You chaps look rather wet down there. Hard lines. Cranwell next stop. They taught him how to fly, but always stuck close by him in the sky. Indeed, his first instructor sat so near that what he said was too loud to be clear. Sir Douglas Baybomb was the ace's name, a name festooned with everlasting fame. The German Air Force would not soon forget him. He would have fought Mugabe if they'd let him. He spoke the way he flew, with the authority so crucial to our air superiority. That thing between your legs is called the stick. You push it and you go down like a brick. You pull it too hard and you might black out. Just hold it loosely, don't stir it about. You got all that? Bemused, Charles said, Aye, aye. Roger, that is. Top hole. We are up high. Well, rather things than one might try a bunt. The voice cried out, Not now, you stupid... Stunt upon stunt proved the fledgling Charles to be endowed with an instinctive mastery of flight, as with the cello or with polo. Within a week, our hero had gone solo. The prince had found his element at last, alone, a long way up, and moving fast. He flew a phantom at the full ten tons, which is as quick as buckshot goes from guns. At Sandringham, his father, shooting partridges was hip-deep in a heap of empty cartridges when Charles streaked overhead without a sound, and then a clap of thunder shook the ground. The Duke looked up to watch his son cavort, and just this once he did not mind spoiled sport, while in the shooting break the Queen looked down, her face divided between fear and frown. But Charles was far already out of reach, and twice as fast as cautionary speech can travel through the air was on the climb. He let the earth spin round him all the time until he was as high as you can go and still come back. He felt his own blood flow. He heard his heart. His breath was like a storm. He felt he was a god in human form. If only he had not been cursed by birth to spend his every waking day on earth, he could have made his life up here in space. He tapped the visor that concealed his face and blessed it for the way it left him free to taste the joys of anonymity. Then he came down to be awarded wings. The wings, along with several other things, went on his chest, which also boasted anchors, crossed parachutes, embroidered super tankers, and comparable insignia from all the services. He had them wall to wall. He wore a fore and after admiral's hat, on top of which impressively there sat a full field marshal's cap sporting a pair of pilot's goggles. Reading down from there, you found Prince Charles to be Colonel-in-Chief of Foot Guards, Fire Brigades and Flood Relief. His belt was hung not just with swords and pistols, but plastic bags of breathalyzer crystals, denoting his high office in the police. His flying boots were lined with golden fleece and came equipped with spurs. As was the rule, he slow-marched out past the assembled school and off to Windsor, where Grandfather's brother now lay in death. On orders from his mother, he met the Duchess at the castle gate. You'd think it'd never be in your head of state. She sighed through her black veil. It's just so cheap that he's not in the abbey. I could weep. Your grandmother's to blame. She hurts my pride just any way she can. Let's go inside. I did the flowers myself. You see that smile? He's doing that for me. That was his style. I guess for me he'd do most anything. That's why they had to stop him being king. They made him feel that it was them or me. It was because I gave him liberty. Regaled with such a salad of strange notions, the future king fell prey to mixed emotions. 
How could he let this poor sad creature know that what she said was only partly so, and all irrelevant? One had no choice. All he could do was ask in a soft voice, Have you come far? She had indeed, and yet one sensed she'd gone as far as she would get. Charles left the chapel. In his Aston Martin, he found a large beribboned cardboard carton marked Fragile. When he ripped the wrappings off it, the sight inside redounded to his profit. It was a crate of Guinness girls, each richer than Croesus and as pretty as a pitcher. They had names like Anita and Sabrina. The one that kissed him like a vacuum cleaner was probably Sabrina, since Anita burned steadily like an immersion heater, unless he'd mixed them both up with Miranda, who seemed less keen to talk about Uganda. There were four more at least by his rough count, and all in all it seemed a large amount of good luck to be having all at once, but Charles by now was much less of a dunce in matters amorous, and knew just what to do, and more importantly, what not. Indeed, these days he went out every night. Impressionable hearts broke left and right. Davinas and Amandas ran with throbbing aortas toward him and retreated, sobbing. Both the Biancas, all the Bonbon Carters, came flying at his head with snapping garters. Most he threw back, the nicest ones he kept, but later, if not sooner, they all wept. The Queen's lady-in-waiting disapproved. Eventually the Queen herself was moved to enter her objections. We are grieved to see these poor young women thus deceived. From base activities you must desist and aim for highborn names. Here is a list. Abashed, Charles trotted off with dogged loyalty to check out Europe's range of nubile royalty. We thank you for your loyal attention and hope that you will stay with us for the completion of this performance. Marie Astrid, their lunch was like a wake. Monaco's Caroline was a mistake. Marie Astrid just sat there looking numb, and Caroline was either deaf and dumb or cowed by her cool mother, Princess Grace. Charles waved his hand before her pretty face to see what it would take to make her think of something new to say or just to blink. She stared right through him at Philippe Nouveau. The mismatch that resulted goes to show how even at high level hearts rule heads and strange bedfellows land in royal beds. Schloss after castle, chateau after court, Charles drew a blank. The list was growing short. The last name on it drew him from the old world to the new. His royal blood ran cold when President Nick Dixon introduced his daughter Tricia. The poor girl unloosed a melting smile while Dixon chose a tape for them to dance to. There seemed no escape, but luckily the sound that filled the room was less the voice of Venus than of doom. You guys will have to deep six the hot dough. The rest of you can ditch the cars and blow. We need a lucky break to beat this rap. We're still up to our eyeballs in the... Zap went the machine as Dixon switched it off, a noise compounded by his nervous cough. I'll leave, he fondly said. You two alone to get acquainted. Don't answer the phone. Or if you do... Just tell them I'm not here. And out he went, only to reappear upon the instant. Goddamn closet door, it always fools me. You two just ignore my presence while I'm in back of this chair. I'll keep real quiet. You won't know I'm there. They're paying you enough? Asked Charles, employing a trick to stop the conversation cloying that Uncle Dicky said worked with the Yanks. But Dixon was half hidden behind banks of cushions and expressed no clear reply beyond a haunted shifting of one eye. The salient fact was plain as Tricia's face. The transatlantic match would not take place. From outside on the lawn, a starter motor was heard and then twin turbines and a rotor. Charles ducked out through the downwash, climbed aboard and nodded to the pilot. Off they soared, while Tricia stood as windblown and forlorn and lost as Ruth amid the alien corn. Book name. In moments snatched between official duties, 
Charles squired an endless string of casual beauties. Canoes full of them called for him in Suva. He had them by the van load in Vancouver. Samoan soft hands filled his cup of kava. He was the almond of their eyes in Java. But never once did he neglect his role. The Union Jack came twitching down the pole in country after country. Charles saluted. The local navy fired its gun and hooted, and up went the exotic square of rag, henceforth to be the newborn nation's flag. The empire was no more, yet more than ever, its quondam members appeared loath to sever their old alliance with the British throne. The queen sat solid on the stone of scone, or, as they say in Scotland, stone of schoon, and showed, while men walked weightless on the moon, that though the world was made of changing stuff, enough, in her opinion, was enough. Some things were simply best left as they were, the very foremost of them being her. On TV, she announced her jubilee. Good evening, everybody. This is we. We think it meet to rindly celebrate our quarter century as head of state. Let joy be unconfined and hearts be large. Our son, the Prince of Wales, will be in charge. May all our subjects be with mirth infused. Astonish us. We wish to be amused. She made the royal gesture and dissolved. The ghostly image rapidly revolved and turned into the prince who cleared his throat before, as always, striking the right note. <clears throat> One finds oneself faced with the cheerful task of having as much fun as one could ask. Particularly, one looks forward to the clever things that will be done by you. There will be candy floss and penny rides and cries of rapture rising from all sides. You ladies will no doubt be baking cakes. Let's show the world we've still got what it takes. One will be glad to answer any questions. Don't hesitate to send in your suggestions. That night, so many bonfires were ablaze. Next day, the land lay drowned in a thick haze. A man called Willie Hecklethrone, MP, denounced it all as sheer insanity, a suicidal wallow in nostalgia. He might have been complaining of neuralgia for all the notice anybody took. The people either craned their necks to look or put up cardboard periscopes. Fleet Street was crammed ten deep each side. Between their feet, El Vino's journalistic clientele crawled feeling more than usually unwell, as down the smooth and sawdust-strewn macadam came rolling the great golden wheels of Madam. She gave the royal wave. Beside her sat Prince Philip in a rather terrific hat, but their collective splendour was outshone by him who rode behind. Their eldest son, clad in the uniforms of all three forces, stood in a boat drawn by a team of horses, a scout car, a light aircraft and a tank. Since no one else now equalled him in rank, he gave himself new medals by the box. A busy batman pinned them on his socks, there being nowhere else to put the things, such as the bric-a-brac that burdens kings. The crowds cheered the parade up Ludgate Hill to where St Paul's disgorged its overspill of droning clerics. Waiting in the nave, Archbishop Cogwheel was all set to rave. His chance to show the Queen how he adored her had come. For what seemed half a day he bored her, and all the waiting world with such a spiel as made death a release and time unreal. Yea, blessed we are, he moaned. We are thrice blessed, nay, four times. But let's spare ourselves the rest, and switch to the live coverage on TV, on which the first familiar face we see is Malcolm Mothermilk. One simply staggered. The scale of self-delusion leaves one haggard. How can these people carry on this farce? The fatal triumph of the middle class is surely this collective form of madness. The whole thing fills me with a piercing sadness. And listen to that poor, wet, bleating snob who calls himself Archbishop. One could sob. The Queen looks ready to do something drastic. But David Dross thought otherwise. 
Fantastic, amazing, super, marvellous, what a show. Good evening, welcome, fabulous, hello. The Queen looks stunned by all this eloquence. She looks down at her lap. You get the sense she finds the sermon fabulous, amazing, fantastic, super, welcome. Glasses blazing, the face of Alan Wanker filled the screen. The cool, crowned cutie pie we call the Queen caught in a candid close-up. Is she tired? The drive of duty which once fiercely fired that frail form finally now fades and fails. The world looks to the wonder boy from Wales and wonders, will she fall out in his favour? A succulent scenario to savour, but while her son stays single, sources say, the word on abdication is no way. The Queen slept soundly through cogwheels oration and woke refreshed to rule her grateful nation until such time, at least, as Charles should choose a consort congruent with her strict views of suitability. Meanwhile, the Prince continued to ignore familial hints and went on taking out the kind of girl who would have made his mother's top lip curl had that appendage been less disciplined. But now a big event was in the wind, the Prince's 30th birthday banquet ball. Home came the far-flung royals, one and all, to wear inside Buck House a four-star feast, enough for 20,000 guests at least, a welter of gold plate and silver vessels, on groaning boards laid out on creaking trestles, awaited them and all the family firm, plus everybody worthy of the term, celebrity, drawn from all social levels, by St. John's Stilt Heels, master of the revels, who with pomade brushed through his flopping locks, in buckled shoes and poised his pouncet box, now made a leg and swept his free hand wide, and nose dived like a fawn shot in mid-stride to greet the queen. What is that thing you're wearing? She sniffed. We find its neckline far too daring. His answer came from well below her knees. I'm clad in Queen Victoria's chemise, Your Majesty, the better to pronounce my love for every frippery and flounce comprised in the great nosegay of regality. Apparelled thus, I flaunt my partiality. Still heels arise, she said. You have done well. We would sit down. I bunions hurt like hell. The whole vast company sat down to dine. Charles heard a voice. You're going to like the wine, said Kerry. There's some more out in the truck. Good Aussie stuff. None of that dago muck. I trod the grapes myself only last week. These poofters will end up too pissed to speak. Cop this black tie of mine. It's lizard skin. Are all these sheilas yours? You're in like Flynn. And off lurched Kerry to his lowly place, as straight away the grand event gained pace. From famous mouths too many to be counted, the decibels of conversation mounted. The three degrees were fending off the goons, while Brezhnev and Giscard were stealing spoons. To do this, neither of them used both hands, unlike Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. And Willy Brandt had brought some Russian spies, of whom one was Lord Lucan in disguise, and Lady Hardhart sat with Helmut Schmidt, and both found Jimmy Goldcap a great wit, Hardhart because she thought him buccaneering, and Schmidt because of being hard of hearing. And there was Angie Ripamoff reciting the menu, while across from her sat writing Tina von Braun, whose magazine The Titler each month made her head bigger and name littler. And all the daughters of my Lady Frisia shone in their different stunning ways, but easier than saying how they vied with one another is just to say they took after their mother. And Harold Halfpint sat there looking harried from being unsure whether he was married. He paused and looked around him in a daze, as if attending one of his own plays. And Richard Inkwell sat there in short pants, while William Dense Fogg's dim bifocal glance was vaguely drawn to hardy aim high, bending to measure inside legs. There was a rending cacophony as Hardy's trousers split with sheer excitement at the thrill of it, since every nether limb touched by his tape belonged to one whose high rank made him gape. 
and Dr. Ownup sat with Shirley Worley. Roy Junkett was there too, but looking surly, his centre party so slow to get going, it stumped him which direction it was growing. Then Margot Hatbox gave a little speech for those admirers sitting within reach. Who's paying for this function? Is it us? A matter that my cabinet might discuss. My goodness me, I hope Stiltheels has not splurged public funds. If so, then that's his lot. The public sector needs a drastic trimming. They're very good, these strawberries, and quite slimming. Beside Lord Fatman, Bauble's hamstrung sat, and really for that table, that was that, and Tito's head was lolling in his plate because the rest of him had come too late. The Gordons were all there from Duff to Hannah, and all the Fords from Gerald down to Anna. The Soameses were all there, Enoch to Emma. The Joneses were there too, Jack, Freddy, Gemma, Tom, James, James Earl, Anne, David, David Price. I hope I haven't said the same Jones twice. Enough. By now the party was alight. The sound of broken glass assailed the night, as in through the French windows Princess Anne came bursting on a prancing horse. The man who'd won her heart was at her heaving flank, her equine equal, though of lower rank. Above the uproar the familiar keening of dawling withers brought out the full meaning. The Princess Anne mark pillocks side by side, and with what stateliness this couple ride. They're jumping all the tables one by one, Anne mounted on Yoshiba Rising Sun electric hairdryer, and Mark, of course, in charge of that most spirited young horse, Hitachi automatic bathroom scale. And now, with what authority, Mark sails out of the saddle into that tureen and disappears. Well, never have I seen a jump off like it. Anne gives a great whoop to see Mark drenched from head to foot in soup, and she's off too. She's gone, ooh, oh, I say. She's upside down and hits the creme brulee a mighty smack. She's broken through the crust, and now she's surfaced, snorting with disgust. She's flinging bits of custard everywhere, and most of them in Princess Michael's hair. But Princess Michael's intricate coiffure retained undimmed its glittering allure. The custard blobs were lost among the pearls, already pinned into the twists and twirls and braided loops that crowned her noble cranium like an atomic model of uranium. Mayhem had broken loose. Young bloods were pelting the older guests with ice cream, which was melting. Dick Jiggle and the bleeding gits were playing. The standard of behaviour was decaying. The carpets were rolled back. The dancing started. Dick Jiggle yelled like someone being martyred who'd changed his mind, while every bright young eligible sprang forward squealing something unintelligible. The hunt was up. The Queen kicked off her shoes. Nikon told Charles... It's time for you to choose. They're all here, and they're all leaping about. This is your chance to pick the right one out. Remember, though, the girl you make your wife will lead what no sane dog would call a life. So pick one who's got infinite reserves of gravity and disc brakes on her nerves. You want a quiet one without a past. A slow enough start, and the thing might last. Look through the crowd. Just let your instinct guide you. Somebody here will spend her life beside you, with no way back, no sudden change of heart, no clearing of the decks for a fresh start, or even pause for thought. Look for the eyes which, with their sadness, seem to recognise that shared with you, the future is as set as concrete. Look for well-controlled regret. Charles looked. His glance flew through the writhing tangle of sweating bodies bent at every angle and settled on someone who seemed content to stand and be amused by how things went. He'd known her all her life, but no one knows the value of the quality repose until the day which should not come too soon or too late. From a gold-sprayed fruit festoon he plucked an apple. When excitement bores him and worldliness, though all the world adores him, seems childish. Charles bent down and smoothly rolled along the floor that fateful blob of gold. 
The girls we've mentioned would have looked aghast to see its aureate plumpness trundle past, but they saw nothing. Only Lady Jane looked down and winced with what might have been pain. Not even Farrah Fawcett downwards saw it, who had the teeth to pick it up and gnaw it, even had it been solid. When it stopped, it stopped below a shy gaze that had dropped to meet it long before it started rolling, a fact the also-rans might find consoling, since often, in defeat, it helps to know that destiny decreed what should be so. And so, as all the dancers leapt and whooped, Lady Diana, see through spiffing, stooped, and gingerly picked up the shining treasure with what looked more like thoughtfulness than pleasure. Jeez, mate, said Kerry. Got to hand it to you. You don't need much help with the Sheilas, do you? That one you bowled to should be keeping wicket. You think she might consider playing cricket? Prince, ballads used to end with a direct address to their grand object of respect, so why not epics too? Horse guards in summer rings to the quickfire of the calling drummer. The massed band strikes up British grenadiers. The Chelsea pensioners blink back their tears. The escort moves out smartly to receive the colour. Even those who don't believe in ghosts must see them here. The regiments march past in both the past and present tense. Their shadows tremble in the metal hail that fell sideways waist-high at Passchendaele. Their step calls up the roar of tasseled shields rattled by assegais. The battlefields are joined beneath their feet like a long road, green in the distance from the blood that's flowed. And still they march, and would march on their knees, and waiting for them are the Japanese, who blaze away from all sides without stopping, zoom-zooming, shutter-snapping, flashbulbs popping. The colour swerves and dips. The Queen salutes. A horse with Uncle Dickie's empty boots stuck backwards in its stirrups pours the gravel. Gladly I leave you to that cruel time travel in which no new occurrence can be changed by you or you by it. It's all arranged. Your bearskin looks as if it weighs a ton. The crown will weigh more. How could anyone believe you lead a leisured life? But then, like most who make their living by the pen, I have a tendency to patronise all those with steady jobs. I sympathise with your position, but I'm glad it's you that's in it, and that what you're bound to do, you do with some style and do not look haunted by sombre fate or even mildly daunted. I take you for a man. You're not divine. Your feet, I think, smell pretty much like mine, although made from a finer grade of clay. And yet it seems to me the throne today works as it always has to incarnate tradition and thus make it serve the state. I am a monarchist through lack of trust in human rationality, which must be kept in bounds like any other force, or else, if it's allowed to run its course, it can and will work mischief in a fashion beyond the maddest daydreams of blind passion. The two most murderous of modern nations had this in common. They were innovations. Men thought them up. Time's heritage was mocked, and all the worst hobgoblins were unlocked, since only the collective evolution of custom, language, law, and institution can tame that impulse in the human soul whose awful vigour helps to make it whole. Traditions tamed you, too. Thank God for that. With Fleet Street talking through its tasteless hat, you must have felt like killing and been glad not to possess what once you would have had, the power to silence any saucy voice by edifying methods of your choice. In those days, had I written this, cropped ears, a slit nose and a stretch of twenty years, or on the rack, might well have been my lot. Unless I was unfortunate and got some stiffer penalty, such as my head subtracted from my trunk and put instead on London Bridge. I'm glad you're not allowed to do that to me. But though not endowed with all the old prerogatives, you've still some room to implement your royal will. Your attitude will have its influence, and even when you can't much shape events, you can be sure that they be otherwise, without your being there to exercise your foremost function, which is to deny anyone else the chance to deify himself and rule unchecked and say, the state is me, and so go mad through growing great. Some say you lack imagination, they do not twig that the unexcited way you go about your business is the proof 
that if we pay someone to stay aloof and be symbolic, we do best to use the privilege history's given us and choose a family firm who'll make sure that the crown lands on a level head when it's passed down. The colours trooped. This ceremony ends, and for the next one, your friend Kerry sends a note conveying his best wishes. He was shy enough to seek some help from me, since this is his first venture in verse form. I find his effort lyrical and warm, imbued indeed with that raw tenderness only a primitive can well express. Dear Chanda, when you two have tied the knot, try not to spend the whole day in the cot. Remember your old mates in the Austral Isle who'd like to take a deco at your dial from time to time. Tell Di that redbacks lurk even beneath the throne. I'm hard at work digging latrines at school. Meanwhile, I'll post some more food parcels. I don't like to boast, but when I think I helped you find your feet, I hum with pride like blowies on fresh meat. Di might have had a poofter to look after, which would have been a cause of hollow laughter among red-blooded Aussies to whom she is no ice-cold pom Sheila, obviously. Well, sport, I'll bring my poem to an end. Don't let them come, the raw prawn, signed a friend. By now it's time my poem ended too. It does so with my compliments to you and everything the words good luck can mean. God bless the Prince of Wales. God save the Queen.